And thank you, Anna, for your early intervention about gender balance, and Jan for accommodating Anna, and also Jan for encouraging me to frame some of my previous work on the social construction of democracy, mutual recognition, etc., through this fascinating prism of constitutional imaginaries. And so in my paper, I decided to basically, I follow Signe in responding to Augustine's call to bring the people back in. But in a way, I do the next step from you, Signe, in that, of course, I start from a a sense of that the constitution, after all, is not just, yes, a system of rules, but it's a story that a people tells itself about itself. And my question is, in the paper, um, is what happens when this, the constitutional imaginary is not about separate peoples in their singularity, but about we the peoples, and about a polity, the EU, of a plurality of peoples, or what I have called before, you know, a de in democratic theory, a union of peoples who govern together but not as one. So the story that we want to wrap our head around is what does the joint exercise of popular sovereignty, you know, imply, uh, underpinning European constitutionalization, you know, mean for these peoples? And I mean, I start just to simplify with, you know, three, so much has been written on the relationship between constitutional and people, singular. But we, three problems that we need to translate from the singular to the plural. One is of obviously the indeterminacy of meanings, uh, which constitutional imagination must reflect or reject. The term people, I play with it at the beginning, people as the masses, the mob, the pleb, the citizenry, the publics, the crowd, the multitude, Spinoza, you know. So how do we think differently about these different meanings? Secondly, what I think of this, the schizophrenia problem of the people as both the object and the subject in constitutional imagination, the lead authors and the target audience of constitution, the addresser and the addressees, the constituting the constitution and being constituted by it. We all know this stuff. But in this project, this schizophrenia translates, Jan, in, in the fact that the peoples are both um, doing the imagining and being imagined, right? Or, or, or rather, as scholars, we are imagining how they're doing the imagining. It reminds me of Italo Calvino, you know, in If By a Winter Night's a Traveler, when he has his binoculars and he's looking at this beautiful woman reader on her chair and trying to understand what she wants to be reading that he will have written for her, you know, kind of thing. So, and then the third problem is ubiquity is very much a serious problem that, of course, these days the people are invoked everywhere, but in totally different way with a different balance between their as object and subject. Um, and you were describing brilliantly that heterogeneity in national constitution. So I'm thinking of the film Inception, you know, where basically we're trying to get into each other's imaginations and dreams. And how do we do this? I mean, you know, well, maybe we don't have to go that far, but how do we kind of mix our different languages? Uh, how do we create interdependent imagination? Uh, and how do I recognize, you know, your imagination of the stone versus mine uh, when I'm your stone and you're my bird and, and all of these things? So, um, so to these, <laughs> to these imaginative <laughs> questions, um, I mean, I bring, I, I, I always ask questions. I don't really care about disciplines. But I mean, uh, just to be clear, uh, in, in this field of contested imagination, you know, I, of course we have legal history and theory in this wonderful um, group. Um, and I always kind of start with poor um, German constitutional court, Maastricht, who is in its conundrum um, where it basically lacks imagination, right? Because it knows that a state like EU is a constitutional sin, oh my God, but at the same time it wants to imagine European ima uh, democracy through an EP and national um, uh, parliaments, Bundestag, in a very unimaginative way, one demos, one, one democracy. And it gets caught up in that contradiction. So I have, I have, I have a response for the constitutional court, democracy. You can have democracy of peoples who govern together, but not as one. You just have to be more imaginative, German constitutional court. Um, but then, of course, comes my own field of international relations, including the long durée, 
And mm, where part of what we always have to think about is the, is the relationship, I would say, between Vienna 1815 and the Printemps des Peuples 1848. The horizontal questions of how state negotiate their sovereignty horizontally versus how they um, ac um, accept to be constrained or not by their peoples vertically who claim their share of power and how these people in turn horizontally connect to one another. Uh, and finally, you know, the third kind of viewpoint, and it's Urim and, and others, you know, very much a sociological viewpoint, and we're back to Brexit, the, the citizen. How, how do they feel? Um, what is their political imagination of, their, of this third ways? So um, it requires to ask, uh, to realize that, first of all, to, I think, reject a Habermasian notion of people totally themselves schizophrenic, playing against themselves, being, I'm national, I'm European in two different planes. I'm just one person. And I have a kind of messy notion of politics. And that has a bit of Europe, a bit of national. But I have that thing, don't touch my constitution, <laughs> you know, as per Signe. I mean, more or less, right? And how do I relate to the fact that you have this thing too? Um, and how do I imagine how uh, the real pathologies of my democracy that I'm kind of aware of, I'm not a stupid citizen, I'm not a pleb and mob in the imagination of the elite, you know, how, how is that affected by Europe? So that's the first democratic question. You know, how do I understand and imagine Europe affecting either magnifying or, or, or countering the pathology of my own democracy? And that in turn leads me to ask, you know, how citizens live in Europe, what I call, you know, democratic interdependence. Not interdependence managed democratically, but literally how our democracies affect each other and therefore our constitutional interdependence. And, and, and I would skip about methodology, um, I, but I think we have an underpinning methodological conversation. Mostly what I, I mean, I would always refer to as imminent critique, taking the, the, the intentionality out of originism and basically understanding that our imaginations comes from the struggles in the present, but the way in which we cut and paste from them and select from them. So in the paper, and I, we're all going fast, there are three parts, and I'll give you Augustine-type bullet points, you know, ontology, space, and time. The ontology bit is very much kind of a bit of an overview of my democracy with the people's taste in it. Uh, but let me just, and, and it's called unimagining oneness. Because before we imagine, we have to imagine dominant, unimagined dominant paradigms. And a lot of has been said about this around the table today. Um, because I think many of us around this table share in this kind of pure pluralist um, credo, except it's kind of hard to uh, operationalize. But first we have to unimagine oneness, which is an obsession in the EU. One of everything is the solution to everything. And that comes from, above all, you know, in a democratic way, rejecting the two alternatives to, the, to, the, the two alternatives to this de democratic way that both imply one people, either at the national level or at the supranational level, who are the groundswell of, of democracy. But importantly, it's about this third way. And that's part of my conversation with Weiler. We always have to present third way, because I, or else we, you are dumped with sovereignists. And all, we, all this is about is simply recovering the integrity of individual peoples in Europe. No, 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 no. Democracy is a highly demanding idea of the peoples because it calls for horizontal intermingling between people, other regardingness, and the deepest of deepest mutual recognition, which is much harder than the convergence and harmonization that, and the merger of our peoples, that, because we all know that keeping that difference is what is hard and it's the only thing we have in common. And, the, and I also make the point, two other very quick point, is that um, there's a strong and weak version of this third wave vision. One is clearly the no demos thesis, you can have democracy with the plurality of peoples. But the other is the many demo thesis, that we can have 29 demo. I mean, the importance, yes, there is a thin European people. Yes, it can underpin a certain constitutional discourse. What's important to accept is that the, 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 where the game is, the game is at the national level or other maybe functional demo. We could talk about the, how you circumscribe these demo or regional demo these days. Um, but the point is that it's this plurality that matters, not the no demos bit that is only a variant of the story. 
And then the final point of onto on ontology is a conversation I have a lot with Weiler. It comes back to Luke's question. The term union is is much more um, loyal to this vision than the term community, which is organic and where you don't choose a union. Now, of course, you know, a union can be also like the hermaphrodite of in ancient Greece. You know, at the end, we yearn to be just one. But, you know, in a very healthy couple, that's not what happens. So then my second part, and that's what I really want to talk about, and I'll skip really the third part. But the second part is really about reimagining horizontality by trying to appeal um, to different notions of people's singular in, in democratic theory and legal theory. And, in the, and of course, starting with the, two, the classic original dis, um, distinction that is above all procedural, and then moving on to more substantive notions of peoples, and then asking how does, what does it mean for the horizontal. So here, just really to simplify, and then the paper I'll have to, I mean, it's there, but I really need to um, deepen it very much. The first obvious notion of people is, and we've said it many times, people as the constituent power. Um, and and in, in the EU today, of course, I would say this refers to three kinds of imagining. One is the peoples checking the peoples. So it's the balancing between the people. We don't have separation of power, but we have balancing between peoples. It's the, no, it's the notion, obviously, in treaty change of the normativity of the veto. The veto is, is, has a kind of normative value. Um, somebody, um, Claudia, I think, talked earlier about Pareto optimality. So the only way you get that Pareto optimality in treaty change is through the veto. And, and of course, it's the oldest power, it's the, it's five minutes, it's the oldest question in IR in the terms of the 17th, 18th, 19th century of balance of power is the role of small states in ensuring the balance of power. And only through the veto of small states can you achieve that. Um, and of course, problematically, it relies on national level constitutional compatibility between the various models of, or their variants that Signe gave us because it relies on an implicit mutual recognition between our constitutional underpinnings. And we could say more about that. But as constituent power, there is a different notion that has emerged, which is not people's checking people, but people's checking elites, and therefore people acting as proxies for each other in a constitutional way. So it do, if the Irish say get from referendum one to referendum two to keep a national commissioner, they do it in the name of all the peripheral and smaller states in Europe. Um, so you don't have to, you don't need to exercise your veto, they've done it for you. Um, there are many different other examples, but I will skip. And finally, of course, what we see with Brexit is, not pe is both people's checking people, but also people checking out. And it's simply <laughs> the, uh, the opt from the micro opt-outs of Denmark to the, to the macro opt-out. But I would say then that's choice. After balancing, after proxy, we have choice in the constituent power. And, I, and I've written about this and, and, and believe it intensely. In fact, we discussed it in this very room with Jan and Joseph. I believe this is the very essence of the EU as utopia or as democracy as a normative benchmark rather than the description as is because today we see that the elites in Europe have not internalized the value of exit as the idea that we are a community by choice. We are a community of peoples who choose to be together by choice. So that's a constituent power. But of course, in constitutional theory, we all, always contrast this with peoples as governing, the day-to-day -day, uh, peoples as lawmakers or event managers. And here, I, I would simply say, and very much kind of going with uh, Luke, that you know, we, we've moved from, I mean, originally we had a federal anti-logic anti-hegemonic logic of mitigation of power symmetries in the way we did that between people, combined with a functional logic of invisibility of power. And what's happened today is indeed that, um, that we, are, we have entered an era where at these two levels, between state and the supranational sphere, we are making power visible again. And we need to ask how people live and enact their asymmetries of power in Europe. Um, I've written on monetary union and the uh, horizontal other regardingness that could be an alternative to top-down coercion in managing EMU, but it needs to 
ask about what kind of peoples and their parliament can support that. Um, I think part of Macro, Marco's point and the kind of bigger point about sunset clause and sunset policy making was very much part of that. And our whole discussions about uh, the power of opposition, Her Majesty's opposition in Europe, uh, we always talk about transnationalization of European politics, but we need to talk about how people imagine transnationalization of resistance and how people connect against, around, um, across borders, not simply as thinking that how we're going to um, govern together, but how we're going to resist together. And that leads me to my third category of people as contre-pouvoir, back to Claudia Rosanvalon, who doesn't, who forgets his May 68 when he writes about this, but uh, but very much uh, uh, indeed where we are now in Europe today in reinventing democracy through both constitutional reform at the EU level but also subverting constitutional reform which is part of constitutional politics because we are we need to be asking about co peoples as contre pouvoir you know all the way down and the mechanisms by which in the 21st century peoples are able to connect horizontally without necessarily you know, being constrained by constitutional frames, although they could be empowered. And I love to talk about the ECI, the European Citizens Initiatives, as one of the ways in which there we have a formalized way in which peoples are asked or am encouraged to horizontally connect, which has been hugely resisted by the powers that be in Brussels in a fascinating way. Um, but I would also um, talk about the resistance of the movers, of sorry, of the of the settlers, Agustin and Agustin. I, I did want to pick on your point of the transnational workers or the peoples. Your second definition, because of course, what of the 96 percent who don't move in the EU? Those are the peoples who also connect, not just because they have the internet, but because they connect through their other kinds of transnational politics than free movement. So having said that, and having given you these three categories, I would just signal Anna that I have my third big overall category after ontology and space. I have time, I th and I don't have time to talk about time, but if I did, I would talk about the connection between present demoi and future demoi, and what I think is the new frontier of European constitutionalism, sustainable integration in Europe, which has to do with intergenerational logic and sustaining our integration over time in a kind of Kantian reinvented for the 21st century. Uh, a compliment because I know this work well and we have talked about it. But one dimension uh, to where I think you could even integrate it easily. And this is a thing I took from Zenghaus in, in Bremen. He has written on the 19th century development of European states. And what he showed, uh, showed uh, is simply true. They were all very different and they had to diff take different development paths. Now, when we talk about the varieties of capitalism and this kind of stuff, this dimension of different trajectories of development gets under underestimated or does not is not mentioned. And I think it is an important point if you want to understand why one size fits all policies do not accomplish what we hope for. Okay, it's just a point. It fits into your stories of the different demos quite well. I think. Um. Absolutely, and I think we've talked around this table today in about many varieties of liberalism and capitalism and, and state-society relations. But but uh, but one which we haven't talked about is is varieties of memories, and how and the balance between forgetting and remembering in different states, the way in which that state building is legitimized. Although it's part of what Signe was talking about, but in my story, it's about the mutual recognition of memories of memories of how we have contributed to each other's states building, including through war, um, because the best way in which I can encourage your, your state building is by declaring war to you, not you, Christian. I would never do that. Um, so, but, but indeed, so, so the memory of state building and how we internalize this in European, not st some scholars these days want to talk about European state building, but I think that's a kind of a, a misnomer. Um, is, is very important, and indeed these trajectories themselves uh, shape the self-perception, not only of each peoples in all their different ways that the whole literature talks about in, in the way in which imagined communities are imagined differently, but what I'm interested in asking is whether this capacity, this historical inherited uh, 
um, differences in, in collective imagination of strangers in uh, how we can live among strangers, how does it inform the horizontal or other regardingness that we need in the EU that is kind of and the prerequisite of the EU? You, you imagine the other differently if you're French or if you're Belgian. Um, and, you know, in, in Belgium, you, you, a chaotic relationship is okay, but if you're French, the only way you can imagine other Europeans is if they kind of let you, let you create a French, you know, EU in, in Brussels and, and recognize your superiority. I just love to trash my people. Um, but, I mean, we could just go through every one of the 28 member states and, and, and go through this exercise of how they're self-imagining uh, affects their the way they imagine the other. Okay, I have five questions now on my list. I will uh, again start with two and ask you to be a bit brief, uh, so hopefully we can have uh, some qu some answers to some of these questions. First, Yiri, and then Jan. Thanks so much. I thought that this whole conference will be about epistemology, and you brought ontology back, and now we are talking who we are you know, <laughs> and, uh, as Europeans, which is, which is great, but um, uh, I thought that uh, constitutions are basically nominalist ex uh, exercises in containing the power of the demos as a real force, or um, and uh, what you're suggesting is fascinating, perhaps necessary, but uh, yes, it, it brings back the question of culture. And culture as memory, collective memory, um, and uh, how can you reimagine Europe as one common project in such cultural variety? And I mean, uh, this brings us back to social solidarity, and uh, if you ask an Estonian worker, uh, how shall we create solidarity with Greek workers? He will say, well, start collecting taxes and no, don't be so corrupt and get on internet. Yeah? It will be very stereotypical, very prejudicial uh, uh, response. And um, I wonder if your suggestion of transnational resistance isn't repeating the same mistake of Habermas in the 1990s we have, but we will have the common Europe if we have the public sphere, European public sphere. If we are not getting into the same kitschy, res simplistic response that the current issues, problems of Europe can be resolved if we are sufficiently resilient and uh, uh, if we uh, resist transnationally. Yeah. Do, uh, no. Uh, no. No, no, there are far too many uh, comments and <laughs> questions. <laughs> very strict post, which is good. Uh, very short question about uh, this democracy of democracies, democracy. Does it have any boundaries? And does it, does it have any end? Or who can join to be part of this democracy? So how do you define it? Okay. So it's you know asking the question: Does the European Union has some boundaries? What is conceptually, does democracy has any boundaries? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, y y y you're, I mean, much to say, but I think Claudia and I are into the advertising of our book, which we just published, the Greco-German Affair in the Euro Crisis. Um, where we make many points, but one of them is that um, the relationship between imagining and solidarity um, <laughs> is, is, is not just trying to make the other the same. Of course, that has been very much the game. So, you know, in a normative way, you want to ask how the peoples of Europe um, both respect each other's you know, self-government, right to self-government and self-determination, uh, which is kind of the credo of a, of a democratic vision of Europe, but at the same time, and conversely and inversely, um, actually open each other's black box. <coughs> ask, ask, actually ask, what are my requirements in this shared, name of shared values, of shared objectives, Article 2 or 3? but talked about in markets and sidewalks, um, so they won't say Article 2 and 3. But let's say we share these. 
okay, what does it mean in the way in which I gaze into the polity of the other? So I go to Greece and I ask, you know, well, we, me, Estonia, follow, you know, behind Germany, I'm asking them to do X. Who is it affecting? It's affecting, you know, the 20% the poorest part of society. So from a justice solidarity gaze, I start with empathy, but I, I mean, I start with curiosity. I start with intrusiveness that I really want to understand the other's polity and open it up. Uh, that's not what's happening, you know, but from an, again, we are always going back and forth between analytical and norm normative uh, frames. But that, that, and then, as you, so you're Estonian, that's kind of what they want to do. And then, of course, your Greeks want to think, well, if I'm kind of resisting, you know, breaking up my state and dealing with my nepotism and clientelism, am I not taking money from the Estonians whose GDP per capita is lower than mine? And is it fair? And how do they see this? And all of these conversations, obviously. And what we see, which is fascinating, is, of course, the member states, then the, 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 the summit uh, politics of events, as, as Luke would say, you know, do not respect, uh, reflect this plurality of interpeople's gazes because our constitutional setup doesn't allow it, including because the only place in which our positions are present in the European public space is um, partly the parliament, and they are actually rejected at the margin. We could have a much longer conversation about this. And on your point on Habermas, I mean, part of the whole, this whole democrat, democratic constellation kind of makes fun of the periodical reinvention of the European people. Every time there's a big demonstration somewhere against Iraq, that was Derrida Habermas, a European people is born. Same titles, you know, uh, when you had the pensions demonstration. I mean, you name it, you know. Um, that F new European pe these are just movements and protests, and they're cool, you know, whatever. But that's not the European people. First of all, they're like 0.1%, and they're not re representative anyway. So the point is absolutely well taken, that politics is not peoplehood, and agonistic politics um, is what Europe ought to be all about. And, you, and, and so, you know, democracy is exactly resisting the idea that if you have a transnational action, it's creating a, trans, a supranational demos. It's again the obsession of oneness, on imagining oneness. And I've even said that to Habermas himself, who was once heard me talk about you know, democracy. And I said, yeah, you first need to only imagine oneness. He's like, ooh, OK. Um, anyway, we can. So uh, and finally, Jan, uh, it's really a question that I'm obsessed with and I've been thinking about for so long. And, you know, the more you think about a question, the less answer you have, hopefully. Um, and so, you know, um, because there is the, the age-old functionalist temptation. Let's remember the last line of Jean Monnet's memoir, you know, that one day the world will be the EU. I mean, there was this Polyanic you know, kind of notion that we're creating a logic that is expansive to the rest of the world. Not just Europe, Europe as a model, but it's contagious what we do and we promote it and all the rest of it. And so, in a way, you could say my, uh, the, the, a democratic frame with its pluralistic, you know, uh, uh, take allows, it is more open to this kind of vision. Because it's when you have one European demos that, what's the point of a European demos is othering. And why I hate European demos is exactly because it's othering, whether it's the US or Islam or the third world or whatever. So if we don't want, if we don't do othering, thanks to a European demos that underpins a constitution, then we, we, maybe we could be expensive forever. But I don't like that, because that's standards of civilization. That's another old type of trope of, of the EU. So, so indeed, we have boundaries. Um, and and they, are, they have to do with a politics and a civics and, and a geopolitics. Um, and you know, we could talk much more about the fact that they're fuzzy and thick and not predetermined, but that, I'll stop at that. Yeah. OK, so while you're being filmed by a Lithuanian filmmaker in the corner who's been here all, the, all along uh, during all of the day, we will continue with the last four questions, which, uh, I mean, they're between you and the drinks. Uh, so um, it's probably up to you. Um, I think we'll take another two. Uh, Hugo and then uh, Michael. Uh, it's more a comment than a question, so I won't try to keep it short. But, uh, uh, it's fascinating what you say about unimagining uh, oneness. But I was wondering why is it so difficult, and also what you said about Habermas, it fits quite well, 
And we just wanted to stress that it's not only a problem or European or about European integration. I mean, uh, state building has been about constructing oneness in you know, monopolization of resources and constructing the theory of sovereignty and everything. So it has been a long, centuries long process of building oneness and even more if you go back to the theological background of all this. So I was just wondering, is it, an imagining oneness, isn't it also an imagining politics as it has been um, imagined and practiced for centuries? Or maybe just a French uh, point of view, but uh, I don't know if there was just an uh, interest. Thanks, uh, Calypso. Um, yeah, I'm very sympathetic to the normative project. Um, a bit skeptical about the logistics of this transnational resistance. But I want to push into it on a different point, which is the um, the, um, the value of national resistance. Um, and we've gone all, we've kind of gone all day without mentioning Brexit. <laughs> we're now going to spoil. Um, but I mean, we could take the, the Greek uh, Ochi vote in 2015 as maybe a counterpart to were thinking about national resistance to, to various successes and failures. You mentioned um, Brexit as checking it out. But Brexit was also checking the elites. It was also yeah, yeah. Yeah, checking, exactly. as you put it, the balancing between people. So to what extent do you see Brexit as playing uh, a legitimate role here? Um, you know, do we have to recognize that at some point the EU is part of the problem rather than the solution to the problem of democracy? Are you willing to go that far? Um, you go, yes, French have the hardest time, you know, Jacobin, centralizing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and of course, it may be, uh, as a French person exiled in Britain, you know, may, I am often accused on the continent when I have this land that I've been brainwashed. I'm, I've lost my Frenchness and I've been brainwashed by my, my British friends. But, um, but I'm, I'm thankful that <laughs> if I have been, and I don't think so. But, um, and, and why is it so hard? I mean, in part because mimetic reasoning is always easier. I mean, during the Constitutional Convention, when I was a delegate working for the Greek presidency um, in the Presidium, we organized, in collaboration with them, a, a, a conference in Oxford on national constitutional models and how they inspire the EU, not how they're compatible or whatever, but how each nation projects itself. The only non-mimetic ones is, of course, Westminster, who wants the EU to be the opposite of Westminster. But every other national constitutional discourse was mimetic. We want the EU to look like our constitutional system, especially, especially the Germans, actually, on this one. Um, so, so if you look at most of the institutional magic bullets that short or of treaty reform or treaty reform, they're, so often they're just simply mimetic, a European Parliament, a European Senate, uh, one president, I had to, you know, during the <coughs> convention, the Greeks wanted to promote one president, they had the obsession of oneness too. Um, and of course, you go to Philadelphia, you, you know, the, uh, the American constitution, so it's also US envy, you know, one country, one people, one constitution, it's everywhere, right? one United States of Europe. So, but if we don't, so the, the intellectual agenda and exercise is when I, what I've called in the past, you know, uh, going back to Dal and the two democratic revolution, um, a transformation, that we are engaged in a third democratic transformation. And the first two were about different scales of oneness, the city and then the nation state, back to Christian, um, and, rep you know, and representative democracy. And so now we're trying to invent transnational democracy. And transnational democracy is a real transformation. It's not mimetic, it's transformative, but transformative in the, in the deepest you know, sense. It comes back to some of Marco's you know, point. So, and transformative is our harder because it's about you know, imagination. Whether it's about utopia in Luke's, uh, you know, vocabulary, we could have a long discussion about this, but because transformation is not necessarily utopian. Transformation is about the journey, not necessarily the teleology. So you can have transformation without teleology, and I think that's part of our, you know, EU conundrum. Um, and Michael, first of all, the, the point about transnationalizing resistance, uh, was a quip. I mean, it's not the most important bit of what I want to say, but I mean, I, st I do think that, you know, we, it is, you know, Streak and others, and in, in Germany, uh, there's a lot of, of uh, 
uh, it, it's important to ask to what extent the silver lining of the euro crisis, if there is one, um, beyond is is that beyond all this prejudice and mutual ascription and you know my people's is bigger than yours kind of very macho politics, um, you know we've had uh, peoples getting to know each other, you know couples get to know each other when they fight, you know and that's what happened. The story Claudia and I tell in this book is about that, um, and so. The transnationalization of insults is as much, you know, a base for mutual recognition as the transnationalization of love, you know. Um, but now to your more important point about e uh, exit, I said it very quickly earlier on that, you know, I do think that if the if a union of peoples is this is back to Weiler and perhaps his biggest contribution, I think, you know, is we're together by choice. This is why we're not 1865, you, you know, your uh, American Civil War. This is why, you know, Article 50 was fought so hard and I was there on the floor and I, I participated in the drafting. And, you know, the biggest, the, 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 you had this war with the Federalists, the unreconstructed Federalists saying we can never, you know, accept this article and it's a sovereignist and you know some of us the little third way group in between would go to them and say this is this is the greatest gift to the european ideal it's not a sovereignist you know ploy it's it's about the very essence of the eu um and you know a fascinating debate at the time so i couldn't agree with you more i mean the thing is when i defended in theory exit at the time I didn't dream that my country of adoption would actually exercise, you know, and prove my theory by a enacting it, which is very problematic because I'm totally inconsistent between my theoretical thinking and, and my praxis, you know, which is a right that I claim. <laughs> okay, we have two final questions. Uh, it's you in the back and then it's Lou. Uh, just very quickly, I want to interrogate a little bit, and this goes back to some of the panels this morning about the potential for imagination and narrative to be as violent as it is inspiring. Um, even uh, Walter Benjamin would say the act of myth-making is in itself a violent act. But also to query about the notion of othering that I think we see in evidence quite regularly now in Europe, and especially in the last few years with the refugee crisis and this um, huge fear of the other, external other, and, and whether this is a reflection of the internal other um, that we see in Europe, which is a very multicultural space, uh, but we see evidence in all kinds of contexts um, about a rejection of the notions of multiculturalism. Uh, many years ago, um, Merkel and Cameron both stood up and gave speeches within a few months of each other about uh, the failure of multiculturalism. We see it also in a wider European sense about the, you know, the, the Greek financial crisis, the, the, the center versus the periphery, or uh, the east versus the west, with Jan saying the west co-opting sort of uh, the post-communist, or the, the, the narrative of the fall of communism and the fall of the wall in 1989. So I wonder, can we, um, if in fact the center of the narrative has some inherent violence to it, uh, can we correct it in order to recover the Thank you, Chair. I'm going to go back from the uh, national resistance uh, back again to the transnational resistance because I think it is not uh, a sideshow and, and it's not a sideshow in your intellectual project uh, either, colleagues, so I, I would think. Um, because um, it's already happening, of course transnational resistance, uh, both on the left. Uh, we discussed uh, the project of Varoufakis earlier on, who founded a political movement in Berlin, uh, not in Athens. And there's also That's because no one loves him anymore in Athens. No, but, you know, no, just no. There's more to that. It's also <laughs> strategically, uh, he's going to the place of visible power uh, and to uh, oppose that at the center. And there's, uh, there's of course, uh, transnational resistance from the right, from the extreme right, you can call it Steve Bannon, or you can call it uh, all of uh, friends uh, in Europe, including in, in Western Europe. Now, why is this important? Because it, it creates a space for what I call, uh, in my <laughs> latest book, opposition, which is crucially what has been missing in, uh, in Europe and in also in Europe's constitutional imagination. That is to say, 
political opposition was supposed to take place in the European Parliament, but it doesn't because it's a place of consensus. Mm -hmm. And then it took place, let's say, in a, a national scale, uh, national against Europe, which is also not very satisfactory. But what we now see happening, in fact, is uh, an organization, you could say, you could say, democratic uh, opposition, where uh, there's an, uh, uh, various national spheres uh, joining forces against a Brussels-Berlin consensus both in the Eurozone on the left and in the, in the, in the migration uh, crisis or, or dealing with that in, uh, uh, on the right-wing opposition. So I, I think that is highly relevant uh, and recent and there are political entrepreneurs inventing the uh, public European sphere which Habermas ask for, always be careful what you wish for, of course. Um, so I, I do think we, we should take this very seriously. So, sorry, it's not a question. If there's a question, it's going to be too general. So it, it'll be for the coffee, but I'll ask it uh, anyway. I never know, Calypso, to what extent your idea is normative and where it is simply descriptive. But we can do that over quickly. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, both questions require drinks, really, uh, um, because all of us could speak to, and especially our friends on the, in, in, on, from Central Europe, to, um, I mean, the imagination of the other within, um, um, which is a fascinating, you know, question, the real other versus the imagination. We could speak about the fact that I think it's too easy and quick to, um, pull, lump all the, you know, Eurosceptic movements as xenophobic and othering within uh, that, I mean, at least in Britain, I think that a lot of the taking back control had very little to do with xenophobia. Uh, in fact, some of it was about replacing black, white faces with black faces, not just from the minorities voting in Britain. I mean, I often heard from blacks, from, sorry, from white, white Brits, that, you know, why should a, you know, Bulgarian take precedent over an Indian in, you know, my local pub in terms of coming to work? Uh, and, I mean, not that this is a universal thought, but so, so this question of what non-discrimination among European means, you know, we, we've asked the question in, in Oxford ourselves, you know, hey, our ambition, like all our universities, is to, to to take from a pool of global talent in the 21st century in this global world, you now why why privilege European talent for all sorts of reasons? Okay, you know we get it. You know European construction, but you know our kids are cosmopolitan, and at least it's a difficult question that we must grapple with. Um, so, but it does raise the question of what's the relationship between the internal other in Europe from other member states and the external Europe and whether that relationship is porous or dichotomous. And that, I think that's one of the most fundamental questions we're facing today, where the pushback, the intense pushback by European elites uh, against trying to question internal free movement is matched by, of course, an intense you know, agenda of, of, of creating a boundary around Europe and rejecting the other. There's always a terrorist on a refugee boat, you know. So, this, th that is hyper dichotomous when actually from a from a philosophical viewpoint you know our European other and our non European other are, are others that we must engage with in, in similar and consistent <coughs> ways at least for normatively which brings me to Luke's question which is um, <laughs> yes for coffee but simply to be fair to not just me, but you know, the democratic constitution, because it's really been really fun since uh, more or less 20 years ago, I dumped this term in the you know, public sphere of scholars, that we all, many people contribute to it in very different ways, but I think what we do share is a, um, a shared attempt to keep those two balls together, which I think most of the papers in this conference do. That's, that's what imminent critique is. You know, you're describing the world as is, but but it's a very imperfect and problematic world that we're hugely frustrated with and critical of. And we try to extract from this world the struggles, the imaginings, the confluence of forces uh, that we can then use as resources 
to think another world. So, you know, we both say European is, Europe is a democracy in the making. We say the crisis has actually led us, led our elites above all to betray the spirit of democracy, has led the peoples to go centrifugally both try either um, equating European idealism with federalism and centralization. If you're a young idealist, you're going to go behind Macron in that, or, or becoming a sovereignist and, 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 um, and, and all the rest of it. And that third way that we've been trying to invent for so long has been kind of over, um, you know, overridden. And so that's kind of a description of development, but it's informed by a normative benchmark. You couldn't make this diagnosis without this normative benchmark. benchmark. And the normative benchmark, benchmark has to be humble and maybe accept the fact that a democratic vision, a third way constitutionally, is a very uh, unstable equilibrium in game theoretical term. It's not an easy thing to do. And that's why maybe it's an impossible thing. So but, normative. But, but do we have it or do we have it? We, we have it in the making. We have <laughs> it imperfect and we don't really have it. And we have it less and less. <laughs>